Great, thank you all for being here. Um, I know more people are gonna uh, arrive in the next few moments, but we'll get started. Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar, which is um, part of a series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty on the key success factors in addressing Jewish poverty. The National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty is a collaborative of funders, Jewish federations, direct service providers, researchers, media outlets, and advocates dedicated to fighting poverty in the American Jewish community. In this series, we will highlight specific case studies and bright spots from throughout North America with a particular focus on meeting the enormous challenges posed by the COVID-19 pan COVID pandemic and its economic effects. Future sessions will explore such issues as measurement and evaluation, awareness building, virtual program delivery, and convening for impact. Um, please save the dates. Um, they're all Thursdays at the same time from 12 to 1, the next two are May 6th and May 20th. And please look out on our website or look out for the newsletter for more information um, and a way to register. In this session, we're going to dive deeper into landscape analysis and what that means to our work. I will now hand it over to our speaker for today, Susan Didkoff of the Bridge Van Group Boston. She's usually our master facilitator, but today we have a treat that she is going to take this time we have, this hour that we have together to present about landscape analysis, how it impacts our work, how we should think about it, um, and is going to really almost do a course for us on what this means and is gonna be very open for questions uh, as well. So please chat us. Um, use the chat and the Q&A, and we will hopefully have a good dynamic conversation. And with that, I want to hand it over to Susan uh, to help get this started today. Thank you, Susan. Great. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, I hope everyone's faring all right um, in this context. Um, mindful that this is a very difficult time in our country with respect to race and policing and community uh, building and fracture um, and just how important the topic of landscape analysis is in this moment um, when just sort of who's in our community is, um, is a contested question. Um, so I just wanna sort of take a moment and acknowledge that. Um, as Tamar said, um, landscape analysis is one of um, these sort of key success factors of uh, strong um, sort of collaborations uh, in, um, in, in poverty fighting mechanisms. Um, so just to you know, spend a moment on, on landscape analysis itself, you know, one of the ideas that we started to ask about um, with all of the different bright spots that, that we looked at, things like, you know, who's the demographic? Who, are, who is it that um, is in the, the group um, and that's the changing group um, that's experiencing poverty um, in our community? Um, who are the other peers? Who are the other agencies or, or other funders um, in the Jewish and non-Jewish community in our landscape? So that's what we'll talk about today. Um, and there are other lots of other questions that are related to this, questions like, how do we convene for impact? How do we make sure that we're getting all the right people in the room, um, having the right experience um, together to sort of try to pull on the same oar? Um, another area that we talked about was uh, centering people with lived experiences. So not so much a top-down um, only landscape analysis where you kind of start at the top of um, a, a power pyramid or a financial pyramid and work your way down to the beneficiaries, but really sort of inverting that and thinking about centering people with lived experience um, and their knowledge and their wisdom in this process. Um, and so there are a number of other uh, strategies that we talked about, you know, measurement and evaluation and different ways to think about program delivery. But today's focus, like I said, is gonna be on the landscape analysis itself. And we will touch on a number of those other success factors to um, building community action plans to address poverty. But, um, but I just, to, to the focus for today is the landscape analysis. So we'll start there. Um, let me see if I can share, hold on, let me pull up my PowerPoint. While, um, what, so what, we're, what we wanted to get started with is just a question for the audience. You know, when you think about um, who is in your landscape, who are the different um, people that you collaborate with, who are the different, um, maybe people that you um, maybe are in productive tension with or not productive tension in uh, with in terms of the, the all the people who are sort of touching Jewish poverty in your community. Um, maybe we can use sort of the chat to just start to put in some types of institutions um, into that. So I think the things that would first come to mind are things like 
a federation or a local foundation or perhaps you know JF and CS, perhaps JVS. So some of those we hear a lot, but maybe if we can use um, either the, do we have a chat function? Yeah, the chat function to start to, um, to start to sort of put out some other kinds of organizations or entities that you might consider in your landscape. Good, schools and synagogues, that's great. JFS, synagogues, good. We'll get a few more in there. Yep, other charities, food banks, good. Let's get a couple more and then we'll sort of turn to some, some guiding questions. Yeah, local government, good. We're gonna come back to that one. That's a really important one. Um, so what I will do right now is I will uh, share my screen just to sort of get us started. So if the overall question is sort of who's in your landscape, the, one of the very first questions we get is, well, how do I even think about what a landscape is? And so what we did is we sort of pulled together from some of our various um, Fed Lab sessions, our prior webinars, and just some of the experience that we've had doing this work in different uh, communities to pull out what are some guiding questions in a, in, a, in a project like this. So the first would be, you know, how do we think about, before, before we even get to sort of who's in the landscape, just what's the nature of poverty in our city and Jewish poverty in particular, and how has COVID changed it? So this is something that we'll talk about in the demographic data webinar, but here um, the, the important piece is, is that different people are experiencing poverty. And we know that different communities, particularly communities of color or other vulnerable communities, seniors, um, people who are experiencing disabilities, are, um, are COVID is affecting them differentially. Um, and they're having disparate impact. So even just starting with the question of what is the nature of poverty in the city overall, and then because there are some macroeconomic factors to that question, and then Jewish poverty in particular and how it's changed. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the second is how are different segments of people affected um, in this environment? So if there are students or university in the local um, context, uh, what, how are they experiencing poverty? Um, one of our earlier webinars touched on community and you know commuter populations, community college, um, Jewish populations um, of students who are having a very, very different experience than ever before. Um, and so what is it that their, um, their experience looks like? What, what needs do they have? Similarly, adult individuals we know have very, very different needs from families. Um, when you think about housing, you think about homelessness, um, very different needs. Um, seniors, again, have different needs. Uh, people experiencing disabilities, uh, people who are Holocaust survivors, uh, people who are in uh, more observant communities, and there's sort of a, a range of people um, do, so that they feel comfortable interacting with, um, and a level of you know requirement around, let's say, kosher food or a um, you know particular facility. Um, so I think what's quite important here is that different segments are, have very different needs, and so that landscape look has to be um, sensitive to that because otherwise you kind of get this. You know, peanut butter approach where everything sort of spread across and you kind of say, all right, well, top down, who are the biggest um, in agencies in our, in our city or our geography, um, but without that sensitivity to who is getting affected by which problems, sometimes you either miss important people or, um, or you kind of over focus on certain types of institutions who are not actually serving or seeing the kinds of um, people that, that, that we're interested in. So this segmentation piece is sort of easy to sort of nod at and say, yeah, 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 of course, but actually getting into that is an important piece to defining the landscape. Um, the second, the third question is what we just talked about. What problems does each group face? Um, are people facing more of an immediate set of needs, a basic needs around hunger or housing or safety? Are they more long-term needs like educational attainment? Um, even employment can be either a long-term or a short-term situation um, and more of an acute situation or more of a, of a um, chronic situation. And again, how do each of those 
um, problems change for those segments. So if you're trying to solve a workforce question for um, a student um, who needs to stay in school and have you know enough income to to have a good <laughs> have a, have a solid um, educational experience and potentially support their family, that's a different um, employment need from someone who is chronically unemployed or who has difficulties for a variety of reasons um, holding down a job. And that's quite different from someone who just lost their recently lost their job in this you know in the COVID crisis and is trying to either retool or wait for the economy to turn around. So kind of getting underneath that because different pieces of the landscape, different uh, types of services will support different pieces of that need. So it's just that that those couple levels down, um, it's hard, it's important to dig into. Um, question four is around the most effective interventions. We're not going to talk about this here, but certainly some of the other webinars talk about it. Um, the funding flows changing is quite important. Um, it gets back to the question about who the city agencies are. Um, but, but we know that sophistication about that and the landscape of how that funding flow is changing um, is enormously important. So for the um, American Rescue Plan Act, for example, we know that literally billions and trillions of dollars are flooding into school districts and municipalities. And so there's a level of sophistication that's really important sort of in the next, you know, 18 to 24 months to think about um, what are those uh, sources of funds, what are the eligibility for those funds, and, um, and how can those funds be used to really support both long-term priorities and short-term priorities. Um, so I'll give, a, uh, I'll give an example here. So when you think about a landscape of a funding flow, um, so some of the ARPA funding flows are to replace revenues that were lost during COVID. Other ARPA funding flows are about one time, because they're one time monies, they are one time infrastructure investment. So, Wi Fi or broadband in a public housing uh, situation um, or public housing complex um, or something like that. But because they're one time funds, um, they're not something that you can kind of build into ongoing operating budgets. Because if you do that, as we saw in 2008, you kind of create this giant cliff of of um, you kind of build up these budgets, um, annual operating budgets, hire people and create costs. And then once that you know, one-time funding goes away, it's, um, it's really problematic. So getting that landscape of funding flows is quite important as well, um, both at the um, national and at the local level, state and, state and local levels. Um, and this is another place where philanthropy in particular can be enormously important because number one, um, individual organizations don't necessarily have the capacity to be analyzing all those different grant streams, nor is it a good use of um, time and energy for them to do so. Um, but also that um, there's, you know, you can imagine at a community level, if someone um, were kind of, a, if resources were pulled together and there were some data and analytic capability to say, okay, here is the map of all that funding and how it's coming in. And here are the places and the different eligibilities and being able to try to help the community match um, with, you know, match the kinds of services that are getting provided and that are needed, um, and maybe the ones that are needed and are not getting provided for a variety of reasons. Um, infrastructure, again, is a good, is a good example. Um, and then being able to match, do some matchmaking and say, you know, if this is your type of organization, there's this whole landscape of funding that you, you know, here are these three or four things that you really should be aware of, be paying attention to, to see if you're eligible for them. Um, and that type of matching function we saw to some extent during COVID, we saw some communities doing that really well, really beautifully, um, and certain types of legislation, uh, PPP is an example, um, where that one in particular was picked up on and there was just a lot of effort. And I would say that that's probably something 5X, 10X, 100X um, to be thinking about now, um, especially as we think about um, the, the, the go forward effect of all of this funds. and. Um, ensuring that it goes to kind of the highest best use, um, especially on these longer term priorities. And again, I'll just pick, you know, Wi-Fi or, you know, broadband in public housing as a, or, or sort of uh, affordable housing complexes as, a, as an example there. So I'll uh, leave that one aside, but if anybody wants to dig into it in Q&A, we can do that. Um, and then, then the last two are really about sort of for all of these problems, for all of these different types of interventions, for all of these funding flows, 
how are the other people in your geography um, lining up against these? Who's providing the services? Um, where are those you know, sources of funds coming from? Um, and what are those interventions that are available in your community and potentially not available in your community, but available elsewhere um, that could or should be brought to the community? Um, so that's sort of one piece of of the, of the landscape as well. And then finally, and this isn't really a landscape piece, it's more of a strategy question of just given all, given all of that, what is the role that any individual institution or organization or individual could play um, and what priorities to set? So um, a federation, a private funder, um, a large agency that's already sophisticated about um, accessing funding flows, um, a small community-based organization, um, lots of different people um, have different strengths um, and different ability to play different roles um, and different levels of flexibility for the capital that they can allocate uh, towards, towards some of these. So um, given any individual actor within this sort of landscape, which the landscape can be useful for you know, really as a, as a community um, process to understand who's there and understand what the different factors are, kind of a crowdsourcing idea, but then within that each individual thinking about their own assets and what, um, what they are uniquely um, suited to do. So I'll pause there, but we can come back to this if we want. Um, what I would do is sort of move to the next question. And here is just an example, um, if you will, of how this one might play out. Um, and it's a question of a particular landscape, is sort of an example of what might a landscape analysis look like for a particular piece of a particular set of organizations or, um, or strategies. So here in this instance, you know, you, we might say, you know, the purpose of a landscape is to identify the most compelling X and sort of define what that is. It might be a food situation, it might be a um, housing situation um, or intervention. So what does that look like? And then be very clear um, with some of your um, with some of your sort of your peers about what kinds of programs are you looking for. Um, some of them again might be focused on seniors, might be focused on um, people with families, might be focused on individuals. Um, and so you have some sort of funneling process where the criteria are very clear, saying, okay, well, we looked at all 42 programs doing X, Y, and Z that maybe have been analyzed by a local. Um, by a local research institution or identified in some way. Um, another good way, especially if there isn't formal evaluation information is looking at um, organizations that have already been vetted through a philanthropic process um, in the community. Um, but just at any rate, some, some sort of big piece of the, of the funnel and being just transparent about how, how organizations can and, and should get in, and then some way to start to narrow it. It could be narrow by geography. It could be narrow by who they serve. Um, another way to narrow it, as you see in the bottom left-hand corner, is narrowing it by the evidence base of the program. Um, and then sort of the sort of other ways to add on once you kind of get through a funnel, sometimes you realize that that, that was all well and good, but we also need to expand the funnel maybe horizontally. So it's not only, you know, we, we might've either left people out of this funnel or there might be other funnels that we have to um, include in our, in our mapping. So for example, on, on this example, you know, someone who said, look, well, we need some additional evidence-based programs. Um, so let's say this was sourced from other, other communities or other uh, peer, uh, uh, peer communities is a good example, um, where an intervention is working there and it doesn't exist here. It's something we want to sort of look at. Um, or it could be something that doesn't have an evidence base per se. Um, in a traditional way, RCTs, um, random control trials and longitudinal analysis, but does have some emerging evidence. Um, and the reason that's important is that, especially when we start to think about um, programs and interventions that are driven in a, in a more kind of bottom up way, um, maybe they're driven by organizations that are not as well resourced. Maybe they're driven by you know, students or startups um, or their mutual aid organizations. They're organizations uh, led by people of color who are not, um, who are not capitalized the way that um, we know research shows that um, white led organizations are much better capitalized um, so that that research can inform this. Um, but even just the other ways to think about it and say, look, you know, there might be things that are emerging and that are high potential uh, but that we don't have deep RCT analysis on, and that's okay, but let's let's make sure we don't lose those um, and we don't exclude them. 
Um, there's a question in the chat about, has anyone taken on the funding flow analysis question? Um, and you'd love to see a template. Not to my knowledge, but if anyone else wants to add that in to the chat, that would be terrific. Um, I would say that we, we saw it for PPP um, in the last round, um, but we did, I've, I've not seen anything like that for ARPA. I think that's just starting up. But it's a great opportunity, again, for sort of a, a pooled, a shared set of resources for a community or you know, nationally in this instance um, to be able to do that analysis and then farm that information out. So if that's kind of a landscape analysis, um, you know, a different way to think about this is a, is a workflow. So how much time does it take to do this? How much effort is required to do this? That's a very typical question. Um, so the first thing I would say is that to do a really good landscape analysis, you can imagine that it will take roughly three to four months of some focused effort. Um, this includes some analytic support. Um, and it includes a longer term phase in because sometimes you need there's sort of an intensive effort up front to get a bunch of analysis sort of in the in the hopper. But then there is sort of a long term, if any of you have been in these partnerships, these long term philanthropic partnerships, um, there really is a much longer term question of how do you um, get the right people to the table and in the right conversation. So the second that leads to the second question, which is sort of how do you think about a working group um, to be able to guide and set priorities? And here, um, you know, one of the things that's really important that we've learned um, over time is that centering people with lived experience in the working group structure is um, it's not done enough. Um, and not only is it a a dignity and a respect and a values question for the community, sort of what kind of community do we want to be building, um, who gets to work on these problems, and, and to what extent do people have true self-efficacy and self-determination to help uh, define what, what resource allocation can look like. Um, but there's also a tremendous evidence base about that, so both from a values and an, and an evidence point of view, um, centering people with lived experience, um, students or seniors or whomever um, in this process um, is, is absolutely critical. Um, and having that happen on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis, um, matching that with people who are in these core institutional um, relationships. So for example, that would be sort of your traditional JFS, um, JVS um, type institution or agency. Um, and sometimes what happens is that, you know, people try to start these things with a big uh, sort of ta-da moment and, um, and launch them with a lot of fanfare. Um, but in order to even get to that point, sometimes you're not entirely sure who the right people are and you're not entirely sure kind of what the mandate of the organization is. So sometimes it's best to kind of consider beginning informally with some with a type of a kitchen cabinet and then formalize it over time. Um, we've also seen that if you kind of try to get too formal too quickly with a working group or you know, a stakeholder group, what can happen is that you, people kind of tend to go with who they know. They tend to go with um, the agencies that they know or the individuals that they know or the leaders that they know, um, which is natural because if you need to put something out there formally, um, you know, there's risk involved in that. Um, and so are there ways to sort of change the process of creating this, this landscape analysis such that um, there are opportunities for people who have been historically excluded um, from the process to kind of get in earlier? Um, the, the third one is engaging with core potential donors to hear their priorities. Um, sometimes this happens and sometimes it doesn't. Um, at the very least, sometimes funders for, for, an, for uh, an analysis like this are identified. But, but what we found is that a critical question early on is um, not only sort of are you interested in this, but, but, but why? And why is this your priority? Why is this something that you're interested in? And what kinds of things have held you back from um, engaging more deeply? So again, for some people, it's, you know, I just haven't seen the right opportunities come through, but if I saw the right opportunities, I'd be pretty interested in being a much more significant funder in this area. Or it might be, um, you know, I just not, I, I'm quite interested in early education or I'm quite interested in Holocaust survivors and I haven't seen a really big opportunity to, to make a difference there. So really thinking through who those core potential donors are, um, either as a peer donor, if you are a funder, you're probably in the best position to do this because it's a, it's more of an informational interview than a, it's not a pitch. You're not, you're not asking for, for money at this point yet. 
um, it really is just trying to understand the kind of the priorities. And it also can help guide, you know, over the course of the analysis, if we found this sort of thing, would that be interesting to you? You, you are potentially solving a problem for that donor because that donor might be interested in funding something, but they haven't seen what they're looking for. And so bringing them um, deal flow, bringing them investable opportunities um, that dovetail with this overall uh, set of priorities, um, but sort of broadening the donor's landscape of what's out there and what's possible to invest in um, can, be very, can be very powerful. Um, We'll get into the fact base a little bit, um, which is the next bullet point. Uh, I'll do that on the next page. Um, and then I think the most time intensive part of a landscape process um, really is who are we, who are we, who are we talking about? Who are we asking um, to be part of this kind of process? Um, I think, again, typically people will say, okay, well, it's these two private foundations and these three lay leaders and the federation and our three core agencies. And wow, it's hard enough just to get the eight of us in a room talking about anything, um, which is not untrue uh, for, for people who've done that. Um, at the same time, it's quite important to think about um, in a more 360 degree sort of holistic way, um, who are the various kinds of people who could be part of a network um, and part of a landscape that maybe have not been included. So we talked about this already, but individuals within each segment of beneficiaries, so people with lived experiences, making sure that different representatives are at the table with a meaningful role um, in that conversation. Um, community leaders are often brought in sometimes just sort of as a one-on-one -on -one interview, um, but they may not be sort of deeply engaged in a process where um, they are seeing their own uh, priorities reflected and a role that they can play going forward because obviously they have networks as well. Um, a full landscape of service organizations, so we'll talk about this one in a moment. Um, a full landscape of funders. Um, this is both in the Jewish and non-Jewish world as well. Um, government agencies, which we talked about, a real sort of power map of, of who knows whom and, and who is out there because so many different agencies, government agencies in particular, touch on different pieces of the um, of this equation. Um, and then sort of asking about the intermediary. So capacity building organizations, consultancies, think tanks, researchers, there's a whole set of, you know, inter networks of, um, of, uh, of nonprofits in the, in the local region um, or nationally, um, those intermediaries can be quite helpful as well. Um, and then sort of thinking about, you know, again, just in this hypothetical three or four month uh, timeframe, um, what kind of effort might we talk about? You know, you can imagine meeting a few times just to check in on the strategy itself. So not so much the the working group meetings where you're probably going to get into a much a lot more depth about kind of wrestling through information, but um, just kind of those pull up meetings to to make some strategic decisions. Um, this page talks a little bit about some sample fact base. We get this question a lot. So, well, what's what's a fact base? <laughs> what should be in my fact base? Um, so the, the starting point obviously is all of the relevant and available secondary information on poverty. There's a tremendous amount of this. So sifting through this in, in an efficient way um, is pretty important because then the second bullet point is probably where the time investment is needed, which is starting with secondary sources that focus specifically on um, Jewish poverty um, in a dynamic way is, is much less available. And that's something where investment is typically needed um, in <clears throat> new kinds of surveys, in new outreach mechanisms, um, or new focused <clears throat> conversations in um, around the community, going out into the community um, and having those conversations on a college campus, if that's relevant, <clears throat> or in um, a senior center, if that's relevant, or um, you know, trying to engage people who who are in those communities to do outreach to those communities, as opposed to against you know only waiting for that once every ten year population study. Um, and again, sort of disaggregating it by what the need is, because some people will just have very different sets of needs um, in terms of food or housing or, or workforce, um, and, and they'll have it over different time frames. Um, this third bullet point is quite important. Um, it's often overlooked. Um, again, in the best case scenario, sometimes people will ask someone with lived experience who's going through this problem, um, <clears throat> their thoughts or opinions, but rarely are they asked, okay, so if I wanted to know 
about others like, you know, other people in your community, you know, in your segment of the community that, that are not traditionally here, how would we do that? Um, and, you know, the, the trick here is being prepared, especially if there's someone with a lived experience of poverty, being prepared to subsidize their time and their effort. So again, I'll just take an example of someone in, you know, housing or someone in, um, on, on a campus situation, you know, giving them a stipend in order to go out and survey their peers in a way that is less stigmatized in a way that is um, respectful and, and peer to peer, um, you might just surface very, very different um, types of interventions and types of needs um, than you would in kind of a traditional top-down process. And that subsidy piece is, is quite important because otherwise it's not something that they're gonna be able to spend a lot of time on for you. Um, and, and in fact, it solves a couple problems um, to, to be able to subsidize that with, with dignity. Um, interviewing and gathering data from the most critical agency partners. This is often where people start, um, but, but for important reasons, it's um, a little bit lower on the list here. Um, it's very, very important. Um, it just isn't necessarily the only, the only starting point. Um, it's a place where even those critical agency partners can be going through these steps um, and then pulling together, okay, so what is it that we know? What new information are we bringing to the table about, about the landscape? Um, Community-based approaches in other cities. This is a place where hopefully um, an organization like the National Affinity Group can be helpful, um, but also places where you know other other networks, such as the um, you know the there's the sort of national networks of human services. Um, Ruben Rotman is a is a great example of a leader there. Um, national networks of JVSs, that sort of thing. So there are other places where those best practices can kind of come through. Um, federation system tries to do this sometimes. Um, and then thinking about sort of commonly available information so that you're creating you know an open source fact base about about who's out there and what they're doing. Um, some places I will say um, in their in the community sometimes are doing this already. So for example, in Seattle, in Boston, in New York, there are a number of different places that are doing this kind of work. Um, and so partnering with those local foundations so the Boston Foundation, the Seattle Foundation, they're not necessarily focused on the Jewish community, but they've spent invested tremendous amounts in um, identifying who the right agencies are, who the right partners are, um, and profiling them at a decent level of, um, of depth uh, can, be quite, can be quite helpful. And so that you're creating a common knowledge base so that it does not need to get um, replicated over time. Um, you know, here's just an, a sample chart of, you know, how might you aggregate some of this information, especially if you're looking across different types of nonprofit organizations, you're looking across different size organizations, you know, just to get a sense of who's out there. You could imagine these bars being by, you know, by race. It could be the you know, racial um, composition of the leadership team. As a as a proxy for how um, you know how proximate that group is, that organization is to the um, to the people that they're hoping to serve. It could be done by um, religious denomination. It could be done by age. It could be done by town. But but having some aggregated information of you know sort of size and numbers um, in a way helps you not lose track of the fact that some of the smaller organizations might uh, struggle to be scaling. And some of that might be for good reasons, but some of it might be that they just have not been invested in um, and or they've been historically excluded uh, from investment. Um, and so sort of identifying where those are is important. So just different ways to kind of visually show some of that information um, and kind of get, to get a common uh, fact base is important. Um, here's sort of a, people often ask, so what's in a profile? When, you know, when I think about a, a profile, what am I looking for? Well, you might you know, be looking for the target population and the engagement model of people who are proximate, who's prioritized. You might be looking for you know, what's the scale? How, how many people do they serve? Um, what's their program model? Um, what's the experience of their staff? Um, how, they're, how they're affiliated with others. Are they a standalone? Are they affiliated with others? Um, if there's a national center, um, how their financials work, um, and then what, what their impact and evidence could be. So you can imagine doing this in a very light touch way uh, for a large number of organizations, but then the ones who maybe need particular investment because they have a particular specialty with a, with a subpopulation, 
um, you would sort of invest more in this effort. So it's not quite due diligence, um, although uh, sometimes this information can come from due diligence, but it really is just it's profile information. Um, and, you know, this might exclude, you know, we're going to exclude, you know, organizations that have their 501c3 status revoked, or we're going to exclude organizations that are um, whatever it is. And, and, and we're going to sort of, and we're going to, the way we're going to sort of do this more holistically is we're going to potentially look at um, sort of some of the, some of the national levels of information that are available like NTEE codes or IRS codes um, to be able to pull out, um, you know, 501c3, as we know, our private non-operating foundations, there are 501c3 private operating foundations, there are you know, non-exempt charitable trusts that are uh, private foundations. Um, so there are a variety of different sort of ways to think about both the philanthropists um, and the funder in the landscape and the NGO landscape. Um, and so these profiles can, can help you with that. Um, but if you can kind of get a sense of the size of the areas that they cover, whether or not they are proximate to the population um, that they're hoping to serve or, or serving, um, what kind of funding flows they're getting from private sources and from, from public sources. Oftentimes, by the way, um, if, especially when the organizations are kind of ahead of the game, um, by even looking at that question, uh, a lot can be learned about, oh, well, I had no idea that you know, X corporate foundation in, in our region was at all interested in this type of poverty. Let's get them on our map, right? It's a way to kind of in a networked way, um, kind of keeping it, it, expanding that, um, that landscape map. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I would say on this page before we move on is um, there are places where only information can be gotten from uh, deep knowledge of the people in that in that um, sphere and kind of the who we know um, sort of modes of, of engagement. But sometimes some of that top down analysis, like looking at the IRS codes or looking at NTE codes, uh, can do something that other things can't do, which is identify people that we don't already know, um, which is always such an important, difficult way to um, to, to get new information onto the table and into the mix. Um, so reaching out to different folks who maybe not at the table now and hearing about their expanding the network through them, but also doing some of the real top-down analysis um, to expand sort of both ways um, and, and pull out that um, 360 degree view. Um, I'm gonna do one more thing and then we're gonna open it up. Um, so one of the questions that we often get is, so what do we do with all this information? Like, this sounds like a ton of effort. Do I have to do all of this? And the answer is no, um, you, don't, you definitely don't have to do all of it, um, but that there are places where this information can be enormously helpful and important in making some or framing some tangible strategic decisions. So for example, you know, if you knew the program model, you knew the affiliate model, you knew the impact, you knew the evidence, you knew who the senior leaders were, you knew what they were after and kind of how they've changed in this environment, um, then you could start to say, all right, well, we're looking for, here's, here's, here's one of the things that we could be trying to coalesce around, system level gaps that prevent us from you know, making progress. Um, sometimes it could be around improving coordination between the agencies. So let's say there are lots of different places where there are overlapping um, you know, or people who are going in, into multiple agencies with multiple touch points, um, we really want to create a better sort of no wrong door, you know, approach, which we've seen in some, you know, work very successfully in some places. And then in the back, on the back side of that, having enough data to be able to um, bring information in and not duplicate services and do better handoffs um, and really just have a much better um, experience for um, beneficiaries um, in the process. Similarly, that's re sort of, uh, related to case management and revised case management process and really increasing the number of people who are receiving case management services um, and then being able to kind of follow up with them and make sure that they are not you know, lost in the system or having to spend an inordinate amount of time um, that they probably need to be spending on generating revenue or income or taking care of, you know, ill family members or young children, um, being able to sort of smooth out this side of it for them as much as possible. So this doesn't become a new friction and a new um, stressor on them. 
Um, and there are a variety of other things. So we're not going to talk about the strategic options here, but if you had the part of the point of doing a landscape analysis like this is to identify where those gaps are, where those overlaps are, who are people who aren't being served, where are there places where um, you know, there's a there are uh, non-Jewish entities that can be serving um, a set of, of beneficiaries in a way that um, maybe isn't available to uh, to Jewish organ Jewish nonprofits Jewish focus on profits right now, um, but with a partnership can or should be um, some much better leverage over time. Um, interestingly enough, in a, in an earlier session um, that we had. Um, Ariel Zwang, who is the new head of JDC, was talking about her prior experience um, in New York City, where um, she was doing victim advocacy work. And um, I won't go through the whole story, although um, if you have a chance, you should you should hear it from her. Um, but the bottom line was that there are definitely things that she was working on where it was just something that the Jewish the Jewish the nonprofit community could not replicate. Um, the types of relationships they had in the in the system, in the criminal justice system, in the victim advocacy, um, domestic violence, um, sort of types of systems. Uh, foster care, that those things could not be replicated in the Jewish community. It just, it wasn't possible to do it. And even if it were, it would be prohibitively expensive. So that's a place where, you know, significantly better services could be brought to um, the Jewish population and who are experiencing these types of um, situations with a partnership and with a, with a clear partnership. And that's another kind of thing that a landscape analysis could, could bubble up that we might miss elsewhere. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a lot more here about you know, specific um, needs of suburban poverty, about specific needs of, um, of, of different kinds of populations. But I, I'm going to stop here. We're going to open it up for questions. Let me stop sharing my screen. Um, and we will see if we can start to bring in a conversation. So there's already a little bit in the Q&A, um, but please do start to bring questions in. I would love to hear them. Um, let me start to uh, read out some of what's here. Um, so thank you for these. Um, the first question was, um, our target audience is parents in financial distress with limited education who often don't have time to sit through our hours and hours of meetings and have expressed discomfort with an academic type planning process. What changes have you seen um, that center the planning process for the audience's comfort in engaging in the work? Absolutely a fantastic question, absolutely the right question. Um, so first of all, um, the sort of couple of basic things, which you, you're probably already doing if you're asking this level of a sophisticated question, but just for, for argument's sake, um, you know, one is paying them. Um, second is uh, providing childcare. Um, third is providing food, um, dinner at a meeting. Um, fourth is providing it in a proximate location to wherever they are. So don't make them kind of you know, drive downtown and pay $26 for parking. I mean, when you say this stuff out loud, it, it sounds ridiculous, but it actually, but it, but it happens quite a bit, um, uh, sort of approximate locations um, and, you know, thinking about ways that you are really making good use of their time. So people often spend a tremendous amount of time preparing for a donor meeting. They don't necessarily spend time preparing for a beneficiary meeting because they're, um, you know, for, for lack of a better word, sometimes their time isn't seen as, as valuable um, as a donor. Um, and in fact, sort of flipping that and centering them means that people who are experiencing these issues, their time is as valuable for all the reasons you just mentioned, um, their time is as valuable. And in fact, using it well and compensating for it and designing um, a process and, and asking them, like what, what type of process um, can we use to engage you um, in this? You know, how much time could you give us? And you know, what would it need to look like for you to, to, to feel um, like this was a part of the process? Um, and sometimes it means not having lots of PowerPoints. It doesn't mean not having lots of complicated charts and graphs or, you know, or, or things that you might have other places, but having flip charts and saying, let's, you know, let's go through some basic information, but this is really about, you know, giving you, giving you information and then hearing your priorities for how and why it would work, what's missing, what are the gaps, um, in service, and um, and oftentimes people who are in that situation will tell you, well, of course, it, you know that that sounds great, but it will never work in my in my community. And so you have to then get underneath that, so that there has to be room in the agenda, um, in the process for um, exploring with with respect and with with equity and with dignity 
okay, don't just say that's a great idea. It would never work for me, but no, 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 you guys should do it. You know, using that as a moment to pause and say, well, wait a minute, like, why wouldn't it work for you? What would it look like if, it, what would it look like if it were working for you? And so continuing at each moment, um, it's just such a rich question, continuing at each moment to, to center their questions and their needs in the process. Um, and there are people who do this quite well, um, people who feel it can, can speak comfortably with all kinds of different audiences, and there are people who are visibly uncomfortable. Um, and so having the right people there, um, and sometimes the right people not there, having um, you know, spaces without um, certain others in the room um, can make things feel more comfortable, especially at the beginning. Um, until people sort of establish a level of trust. But I would just go back to the first pieces again of you know, valuing their time, paying for their time, providing food, childcare, um, you know, transportation, proximity, um, and making this as easy as, as possible for them to participate. Um, let's stop there. Um, other questions or other, other kinds of thoughts? I'd be curious if anyone has um, engaged in um, this type of process, which is a different, way to think about landscaping, um, especially kind of coming back to some of the first comments that we heard about, you know, engaging schools, engaging synagogues, engaging food banks, local government. Um, I'd be curious if folks want to chime in with kind of how they've had these conversations and what they've found to, what each of you has found to be successful or, or less successful in, in trying to create a sort of a broader landscape map. So let's take a minute just to sort of reflect on that. I know it was a lot of information. Oh, there's another question here. Can we send the PowerPoint? Yes, we can. We can post the PowerPoint with the um, with the with the posting of the webinar. Absolutely. Good. So there's another one. Um, there tends to be high staff turnover, especially at the nonprofit level. How do you engage? How do you manage partnerships in that case? Um, that is a great question. I'm happy to start to answer it, but if others want to chime in with an answer, also. Um, high staff turnover within nonprofits, how do you manage partnerships? Um, at, least one, at least one question there is, what is the purpose of that organization being in the partnership? Um, and with clarity on that, sometimes it can, it can be easier to make transitions when there's staff turnover. Sometimes it's not 100% clear why different organizations are in a partnership. And then when the person who is very excited about it leaves, sometimes what happens is kind of the momentum dies or the, um, yeah, the momentum dies or just the, it, 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 it is sometimes there's a shift in priorities in the leadership, um, but often, especially in nonprofit agencies, there isn't a tremendous shift in in mission, but uh, potentially the interest in any given partnership does wane. And so, sort of clarity from the outset as to what what each of the partners is getting from um, a collaboration like this um, is is important because then it sort of says, okay, well, in order for my in order for me to be at the table as a at my entity, my, my institution, my organization to be at the table, here are the kinds of things that we would need to get out of it. Here's our mission, here's what we're struggling with, um, here's what we would need and what we would find valuable. And sometimes you know, being able to expand um, in that way um, sooner rather than later um, can be very helpful to um, not only expanding the number of stakeholders in an organization who are um, who are interested in it, but also just making sure that that partnership is is valuable for the organization beyond the individual um, and and uh, the individual or leader um, if they leave. So it's a it's a great question. Um, I would also say that some of the open source things that we've talked about earlier um, are important um, to kind of creating a, a legacy. Um, you know, one of the things that foundations and, and philanthropy can do is create knowledge. Um, and I think there's an increasing understanding that locking up that knowledge, locking up program evaluations, locking up program profiles um, can be um, counterproductive to what, what we're all trying to do, um, which is share the knowledge. And so having a different way to think about you know, open source of maybe protecting, uh, creating enough of a space, safe space that you're protecting um, confidentiality or anonymity, but to the extent possible, kind of creating an open source um, set of meetings or set of um, materials um, is another way to kind of 
bring broader institutionalization um, and, and acceptance uh, to, to something, um, what, even if there's turnover of, of an individual. And I think this is um, all the more powerful in a, um, in a, in a post-COVID world where hopefully we will all be emerging um, soon. And, but also we will have, you know, things like, you know, Zoom and things like, um, you know, our online approaches still available in a way that were never available before that actually do increase participation and increase um, buy-in and, and consensus building and, and knowledge building and community building, um, especially for people who potentially have mobility issues or who have childcare issues and can be on a Zoom uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, but can't be out of their house, you know, that sort of thing. So all of these different mechanisms that we've talked about in the last question around inclusion um, are true here as well, I think, for broadening um, sort of the, the partnership and broadening the, the base of people who can be engaged. One thing that we heard um, in the PPP uh, conversation um, in the first, you know, in the beginning of COVID, or the third of the way through, is um, that mapping out in the landscape, um, it wasn't necessarily called a landscape analysis, but mapping out sort of the who knows whom in government, who knows whom at different um, agencies um, is a much different conversation, um, especially when you know there's you know, these funding flows coming down the line. And so making sure that that um, landscape includes key influencers or people who are quite knowledgeable. Um, let's say in a city, um, there's a think tank in the city that does economic analysis or does poverty analysis or whatever it is. Um, and making sure that if there are people who are lay leaders on a federation board or lay leaders on a large agency board who have relationships um, with those types of institutions, you know, making those introductions um, and creating those flows. Because sometimes if a, if a big study is going to go out, adding a few questions to it um, that would, you know, kind of riding on coattails of something that is a big multi-million dollar funded study going out anyway, um, is a very leveraged way to think. Or um, if someone's gonna be doing a big policy analysis of ARPA, um, adding in a few questions or, or adding it onto that and sort of the, the marginal cost is, can be quite low. So that landscape of like really, really who, who all in our, in our community is thinking this way and is working on these issues um, can find and bubble up places for, for opportunity and leverage. Um, and, and that was just one that came up uh, from, from the PPP example where, um, where we heard that that was very successful for folks. Okay, we are coming up on time. Um, all I would say to in closing is, um, tomorrow, is there anything else that we wanted to cover in this session before we start to close? Um, you covered so much, so. <laughs> so much to take much. in. Yeah, no, not too much, no. it's just incredibly. But yeah, be rich information. Yeah, this is the first one we've done this way. So we've, you know, very open to feedback for those of you who um, have stuck it out. It's always interesting to see how many people start and how many people end. Um, so it's, it, it is somewhat gratifying to see we've got a 95 plus percent retention rate over the course of this hour. So that's, that's a good piece of feedback. But uh, most of these have been done with, um, you know, very much more high level, much more kind of strategic, much more storytelling about my personal experience doing X, Y, or Z. And so this is the first one that we're trying in this format of being very focused on a, um, like here are practical, um, uh, tangible, concrete questions um, that you can ask or answer. Um, not that anyone's going to do all of them, by the way, I do also need to say that again, if I didn't say it enough earlier, uh, but you know, feedback on, on the format would be, would be helpful as well. And yes, we can absolutely get the get slides out um, to folks. So Tamar, let me, let me turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, what a rich conversation, what a rich amount of information to, that you shared. So thank you for this. It was wonderful to be able to come back and come together, like you said, and I'll have like this masterclass of really, really diving deep into the tactical, um, tactical ways to, to move, move um, different issues forward. So thank you so much, Susan. And thank you everybody for, uh, for joining today. I've already gotten emails from you and I see in the chat that people would like 
uh, the recording and the PowerPoints, and I will send that to you in the next few days as it becomes available. Um, so thank you for, for requesting that. And we hope to see you at our, at our next one, which will be two weeks from today, um, same time. Um, May, that's May 6th from 12 to 1, where we will dive into other subjects. Um, so thank you all and stay well. Have a good day.